We're not going to get finished with Hebrews chapter 13 tonight, but I want us to observe the road we're on. So if, if you have your, your piece of paper, I'm just going to read this paper to you, and you can read along with me. So the summary thoughts of Hebrews chapter 13, this chapter 13 is a practical bookend to Hebrews. We have seen so far many exhortations that stem from this thought, continue or persevere. Hebrews is a book of exhorting believers to persevere in faith, commitment, boldness, peace, and not fall back into legalism or the fear that comes with the high cost of professing Christ in a hate Christ world. In chapter 13, it is a closing exhortation, and it reminds me of someone who is leaving turning around and saying, oh, one last thing. Remember to do this. These are always important instructions for the person leaving to make sure they are understood to the people staying behind. What are these one last thing instructions? Well, several we've seen. We're going to see several tonight. Well, the first thing we saw was continue in brotherly love, not just with words, not just sentiment, but with expression. We saw verse 1, that we continue in being hospitable. We cheerfully share food and shelter and resources with brothers and sisters in Christ, remembering the, Lord, the words of our Lord, in so much as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me also. And he also says, if you've not done it, You've not done it to me also. Matthew 25, 40. You saw that in verse 2. Continue in sympathy towards those paying high costs for naming the name of Jesus. Continue to honor marriage as a sacred and holy blessing. In verse 4. Continue to be content in the will of God for your life. Verses 5 through 6. Continue to remember the leaders who taught you the word of God and how they gave their life to do it. Verses 7 through 8. Continue to remember the word of God they taught you and that you read yourself. Do not be deceived by alien and strange doctrine or the men who teach it. Verse 9 through 12. Continue to bear reproach and if needed, be an outcast for the name of Christ. In doing so, you have followed Jesus in your life because he bore reproach and was considered an outcast. Verses 13 through 15. Continue to be submissive and honor your pastor, proving to be sound in doctrine. They are accountable to God, and they care for your souls. Verses 16 through 17. And verse 18, continue always in prayer. You know, when you read all of these exhortations at the end of just this rich doctrinal book, the one last thing he's giving us, his closing remarks is remember, it's not just enough to talk the talk. You have to walk the walk. It's not just so much as knowing doctrine. We must live this doctrine. And he goes on and he says, I mean, you know, as, as you're leaving, and I know that you can picture this in your mind. You, many of you have probably done this. You, you're getting ready to go. Uh, we did this with Jason. The other day, we were getting ready to go somewhere for the weekend or something, and Jason's alone. And the, the thing that we tell him right before we walk out of the door are the most important things to remember, right? So it's like, okay, here's, all, here's a list of emergency numbers. Here's what you do here. Here's what you do there. And it's interesting that here this ending exhortation from just this rich book of persevering in faith, you know, having being bold in our Christian faith and, and understanding the new covenant versus the old covenant, how we profess Jesus Christ of who he is and who he says he was. And, and the world is going to hate us, but we still stand. We, we still take the, the reproach. We still take the rebuffs. But we must also, it's not just enough to know it, we must also live it. We must also show this brotherly love. We must have this love towards one another. And we must have this pity and compassion. And we must understand all of us fail. P 
people will fail you. No, no matter if they're the, blood, the most blessed people on earth, they're going to fail you. So we understand, we understand that we're all sinners saved by grace. But, and I thought this was enough to give us an overlook of chapter 13. And as we go on to new ground, at least we understand the road we're on now. It's this continue, continue, continue. Remember to continue. Remember to continue. If, if that's the last thing you hear me say, the last doctrine I give you, remember to continue. And that's the charge which he gives here. So we have already looked at those other categories. And we stopped, we, we sort of stopped at verse 6 about so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We understood this in the context of, yes, the writer of Hebrews, which more and more, we, we, I, I think it's Paul who had a writer uh, of the Greek who was recording down what Paul said. I believe this is very specific, and it is. It's very specific. If Paul's in prison, what's his mindset? to admonish believers to do, to visit, to take care of those who are down and out, have sympathy. It could be you that's in prison. It could be you right now who's in Turkey or Africa who are paying a very high price for professing Jesus Christ. We remember them. We want to take care of them. We want to love them. We want to show and, and spread the, the, our compassion to them. Well, in verse 7, he does something very interesting here. He says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Now, that rule over you in the Greek is leadership. He's talking about church leaders. And he's also, in verse 7, he's specifically talking about the ones that you've had in your life who have gone on, who've died. In your past, you may have had church leaders or pastors or teachers, and you think about them. You, you think fondly on them, and you remember them. Well, consider their life that they gave for the faith. Remember their, their example. Remember their testimony. And the thought here is to emulate, you know, to, to imitate their faith. So remember these past leaders who have gone on. Um, you know, I remember, and well, actually, but before I say that, I believe that it's remember your leaders here in verse 7 because look at verse 17. He makes a distinction. Two times he talks about pastors or he talks about church leaders in verse 17 he says obey them that have the rule over you in verse 7 he says remember them that have the rule over you so I believe he is talking about past church leaders now if we stop and think about this what he's saying is remember those who spoke unto you the word of God do you all remember your past pastors and I know uh Brother Hart is definitely one of the, the he was a pastor here for a long time. And, and uh, I remember my previous pastors and I think about them. And it's, he's not saying, re, I mean, we do remember the word, but I don't remember the sermons more than I remember their lifestyle. Do you remember? Like, is, is, that's probably what comes to mind. It's not so much as what they were saying. You know they were sound at the time and what they were saying. But remember their life, the life that they led, the life, you know, it may not have been perfect, but it was committed to Christ. They stood steadfast in the faith. And this is every generation, isn't it? I mean, Hebrews was written a long time ago. And just remember those who were the rulers over you or the leaders, the church leaders, the ones who cared for your soul and how they had spoke to you the word of God and their faithfulness. In verse 8, he goes on to say, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, 
you may be asking yourself, why is this here? He went from you know, admonishing us to remember the, our past pastors, the, those faithful men and women who even taught you. I mean, why is he saying Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever? Because here's the thing. The leaders that you have may be different today, but Jesus Christ is not different today. Neither is his word different. It may, you may be in a different situation. You may be in a different circumstance. Think about this. Think if you were to have to move to Texas for whatever reason, you got to go. You can't stay here anymore. You can't call Metathorpe Baptist Church your, your church home anymore. You have to move to Texas and find a nice Baptist sound church in Texas. Jesus Christ is the same there as he is here. His word is the same there as it is here. It's the exact same. So he has not changed. Your circumstances may have changed, but he hasn't. And so what is the word? What's the word that he has given us? Well, in verse 9 through 12, let us be grounded in doctrine. Remember not only where you got the word of God, but what you got. Don't just remember who gave you the word of God. Remember the word of God itself. Be grounded in sound doctrine. Verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Uh, we will go over each one of these and so that way you can understand better. The first thing that he says, first we remember our leaders who gave you the word and second remember the word that they gave you. And so we also read the word of God. Now, back then, you know, this is before the New Testament was, was written. Back then, it was the teaching and the preaching of the, the church and the men of God. And remember the word which they gave. The gospel of Jesus Christ lives full time in the heart of the believer. If you're a believer, the gospel of Jesus Christ lives there full time. Every day. It's there. So yes, you're going to remember the doctrine. You're going to remember the words which, which they gave you. But we also have other words to grow by. I mean, case in point is this chapter. Of all of the, the exhortations, the new man, the working and, and serving and loving and the fruits of the Spirit. It's not the, according to the letter of the law which sanctifieth. It's the fruit of the Spirit which sanctifies. So there's a warning here. There's a warning to you. Be not carried about. That carried about means carried away. And this word was used for things that would be by force, they would be moved violently through wind and water. I remind you of Definitely Paul, right? Going through all of the, going through the shipwrecks, going through the storms of, there in the Mediterranean. Do not be forcefully moved from the gospel. Because what will happen is these diverse, which means different and strange doctrines. The, the, that means alien. That means a different word. Paul's always warning against that. Ephesians chapter 4, he warns the Ephesians that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There's deceivers out there. They're deceiving. And they could be sincere, but they're deceivers. What did Paul say? If anybody, even an angel, were to come down and preach to you any other gospel than what I have given you, let them be accursed. Let them be an anthema. 
and many deceivers will come. And, and Paul, you know, he, he treats the church members as children, doesn't he? And he, the love which he has towards them like they were his own children. Little chi and then John, little children, beware of the, the wolves that are out there. Beware of the deceivers because once they get you, they get you violently. They take you. And that's what he's saying is, do not be carried away with those things, this strange and alien doctrine. Now, at first, we're not really clear what he means here. But then as we read more, we know that he's talking about Judaism. He's talking about legalism. He's talking about going back into the things of the Old Covenant. Because he says, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, and we'll talk about that in a minute, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. That not with meats, he's, of course, talking about the ceremonial meats, the feast, the, the observances of the old covenant. Uh, you know, Paul, many in Galatians and in Romans, he talks specifically about how the kingdom of God is not meats. You know, it's, it's not the things, the physical regulations of religion. It's not the law. It are, it's... We are to be established in the heart with grace. And we saw that expression earlier. That we hold on fast to the gospel of grace. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That means the gospel of grace. We, our hearts are established. And the, the Lord, he does that with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great? He, he will establish us. He will establish our hearts with the gospel of grace. Now which is in tune with the whole theme of the letter, that we embrace the gospel of grace. What is that? It's the literal sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which only God will put into your hearts. Only God, salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is not of man. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is God being pleased to save you, to call you by his power. And don't we just rest on his power? You know, I was thinking of that prayer list. I was thinking during uh, Brother Richard's prayer, how we pray for Sister Janet. By his power, Lord, heal her, heal her body. We praise God for bringing up Cash Lawson into just a better situation with his health. And, and even at the pit of our very hearts, we mourn over our loved ones, our children, or whoever may be in our lives, and you're not sure if they're saved. But we rely on God's power to do it, don't we? And isn't it sweet? And it doesn't bring you assurance that all things are in God's power. All things are in His control. And it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's based on the Jesus Christ's blood and His blood alone that we look in faith. And we ask him to forgive us. And I was um, talking with one of the, the Facebook friends and uh, the one who lives in Rwanda. And I stopped and I said, Brother, if, do you know you're saved? Question mark. And then I spaced it out. If you were to die right now, do you know for a hundred percent that you'd go to heaven? Question mark. If you die right now and the next time you open your eyes is before God and God says, why should I allow you into paradise? What would you say? What would you say? Question mark. That salvation is knowing you're saved. You stand before God, and Lord, it's not by my righteousness, which I have done. Father, you know I'm a sinner, but it's Jesus Christ and his love for me who died on Calvary. And there he paid for my punishment, he paid for my sins, and he gave me his own robe to wear. Isn't that wonderful? He gave me righteousness that I may enter in. And I tell you, that right there, if you do not know that, and you just say, well, I hope I've done good, 
I mean, I think I, I understand the gospel and I mentally know what it means, but I can't say 100%. I've got a feeling in my heart that's compelling me to heaven and compelling me to love the Lord who died for me. I can't say that I've got that, that 100% assurance. Well, you know that you can have that assurance through the word of God. The Bible tells us we can. You can know. And I pray that you know that you're saved. And if you're not, you come talk with me and we'll talk. And we'll talk in private. We'll talk in public at the cafeteria. We'll talk in the mall. I don't care where we talk. I'll talk with you anywhere. But as we see Jesus Christ, it says here in verse 9, do not be carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. You don't think it's a threat until you've actually seen it happen to sound Baptist brothers and sisters. Many of you have seen people you've known go into legalism, go back into Judaism, go back into the things of the law. They dress their wife up in a burqa. They worship on Friday night instead of Sunday now because they're worshiping the Sabbath. They believe that all that Jesus did was a fulfillment of the feast of the tabernacles and the feast of this and the feast of that. And let me tell you, my own experience, and Brother Jeff may know it too, and I've, I've actually told some other people this. There's this man named Michael Rood, and he calls himself a Messianic Jew. And Michael Rood is... He is teaching false doctrine. He's teaching the things of the law. He's teaching that sanctification comes by observing the law, observing the Torah, observing the feast, dressing in a certain way, doing this and doing that. He refuses to call Jesus Jesus. It's Yahshua. He refuses to call God God. It's Yahweh. Or it's one of the, 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 the names of God. But how? And then he actually, before my eyes... He grabbed somebody that I love dearly in our church and he started getting caught up into this system. Now, how did he do it? Well, at first, it was innocent. At first, uh, I remember the brother coming in. He goes, have you heard of this guy named Ron Wyatt? And I'm like, no, I haven't heard about him. He's a biblical archaeologist. And when you start, and I think it's fascinating. I, I don't need biblical, arch, I don't need them to dig up proof. I, I know that the Bible is true. And, you know, it, and it, I don't know if y'all are like me, when they dig up proof, like they've dug up Sodom and Gomorrah, they've dug up the Pool of Bethesda here recently. And they're like, oh, yeah, it does exist. I don't, don't you say, well, it's about time you, you figured out that that exists. You know, it's been in the Word of God for the last 2,000 plus years and, and then 4,000 years before that. Um, but this guy, Ron Wyatt, he has these videos out there and he goes underneath the Red Sea and he shows you chariots, the Pharaoh's chariot wheels. And then he has a satellite picture of Noah's Ark and there's nothing in nature that's in 90 degrees. And, and so here's, here's the altar that Abraham... And so it was neat. There's no harm and, you know, that's neat. I mean, I, honestly, I, I think it's, it's neat to go to museums and like that. But unfortunately, he was attached. Uh, Michael Rood had referenced this guy, and then our dear brother started veering away into that strange and diverse doctrine. And he wasn't just lightly taken. He was forcefully taken. It wasn't long in Sunday school. The man taught Sunday school. He started teaching that we need to observe the stars. We need to observe them for signs and how we need to worship, different, you know, the things of the Old Testament. And um, at the time, Dad was the pastor. And I said, Dad, do you know what this man's teaching? Do you know what Brother so-and-so is teaching? And he was like, oh, no. Oh, no. We saw it. We saw it. They call him the Messianic Judaism. And don't get in it. The Word of God teaches us. Paul teaches us. That faith is not of the law. Faith is not of the law. 
We understand that in Paul in, in Galatians chapter 2 and chapter 3, he says, the law does not finish what the Spirit has began. The Spirit who has started that good work in you, who has saved you and Christ has sanctified you and has brought you the fruits of the Spirit. Do you really think the law is going to complete what the Spirit has started? No. But you go back into the law and you go back into the things that you can handle and and things like that into all these restrictions and regulations because at some point there was a deceiver. That's why it's important. One last thing before I go. Don't be swept up in this other doctrine. Stay true to the gospel of Jesus Christ as he preached it, as Paul preached it, as Peter preached it, as John preached it. Don't let these people who are deceivers deceive you because they're going to take you, not lightly, but forcefully. If you had only a little while to live, Wouldn't that be one of your one last things? Don't believe every church is a real church. Don't believe every Baptist church is a real Baptist church. Don't believe everybody who says they're a man of God are a man of God. Jesus says, by their fruits you shall know them. Um, Brother Joshua was given, um, I think Brother Richard gave him the trail of blood. And I love that brother, brother Joshua is learning so much. He's soaking up so much. I love it. I love him and for one, having a zeal to learn. And I told him, read Trail of Blood, brother. It changed my life. It woke me up to the fact that it does matter. It does matter which church you go to. Which one is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Which one did Jesus give a promise to? Which one, when you're saved, should you attend? Is there a church like that? There's a million different types of churches, but there's only one true type of church. What is that true type of church? Read the trail of blood, and it'll let you know. It'll give you the marks of what kind of church the Lord has. So you can get carried away in that kind of doctrine, and the strange or an, or an alien. So he goes on in verse 10 which opens up a really big uh, subject here of being true and and sound doctrine. In verse 10, I I didn't say chapter 10, did I? Verse 10, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Now who's he talking about? He's talking about those who are still serving in the physical temple. We have an altar... Whereof, where they have no right, these people who are teaching this alien doctrine, which we have to assume, he's talking about Judaism, falling back into the legalism. Verse 11, and well, verse 10, our altar is Jesus Christ. I'm going to read to you what John Gill wrote about this. I love this, what he wrote. Christ himself, who is all, he is the altar He's the better sacrifice, and he's the priest after the order of Melchizedek. He was typified by the altar of the burnt offering and the sacrifice that was offered upon it. The altar was made of shittim wood and covered with brass, denoting the incorruptibleness and the durability and the strength of Jesus Christ. The horns that were on the altar and the four corners were meant for refuge. Whoever fled to it and laid hold on them were safe. So Christ is a refuge to his people. And who believe upon him and lay hold on him are preserved and protected by his power and his grace. The use of the altar was for sacrifice to be offered upon it which being a male without blemish and wholly burnt with fire was a sweet, sa- a sweet savor to God and which was typical of Christ's human nature. Jesus was offered on the altar of his divine nature, which was pure and holy, and he suffered the fire of divine wrath upon him, and it was for a sweet-smelling savor to God. 
this altar was but one and most holy and sanctified what was put upon it. All which is true of Christ. <laughs> now this altar we have. And we have a right to eat of the altar. Even all of Jesus Christ's beloved ones whom he died for. All that are made priests unto God by him. All that know him, believe him, have a spiritual discerning of him, and we hunger and thirst for him. Well, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Jesus is our altar. He's the altar we go to. We don't go to a physical altar, and that's the, the, the contrast the writer's making. It's not about the temple. It's not about the physical temple. It's not about the physical things. All those things were pointing to Jesus Christ and how he would fulfill them. They're, it, those things were temporary, and they were not sufficient. And that's what he actually says here um, in, at the end of verse 9. Those things, those strange doctrines, those, they did not profit from them those who are occupied with those things. Now verse 10 says this, they don't have a right to eat because they're behind the times. They are not joint heirs with Jesus Christ. They are not children of God. We know what it means to be a child of God. A child of God is a child of God by faith. It's always been by faith. And those who are continually going into Judaism and ministering to the physical things, those are physical objects, all which Jesus Christ has fulfilled. We don't go to those objects anymore. We go to the object of those types, Jesus Christ and Him alone. That's our altar. We'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. We have more to say about standing fast, continuing in sound doctrine. Continuing in sound doctrine. Uh, hold on to that piece of paper because, as you can see, it might be a couple more sermons before we get out of Hebrews chapter 13. And I wanted you to have a good overview of what is exactly happening. How important are these words that we not only learn but we obey as Christians. We obey as God's people to live a life that's pleasing unto the Lord, no matter what that cost may look like. And that's what Peter said. It may or it may not be the will of God for you to suffer for his name's sake, but rejoice. Rejoice if it is. What a great opportunity Paul called it to suffer for him. Paul and Philippians, he says, everything, I count all things but dumb. And what Paul wanted to do more than anything was to suffer like Christ suffered so he could be raised as Christ was raised. I pray that's our attitude and I pray we come to Hebrews chapter 13 as if the great men in your life, the great pastors that you've looked up to who have given you the word before they leave, they turn They say one more thing. Here's the word of God. Remember to continue to walk the walk. To walk the walk. How do we do that? We don't do that by the law. We do that by the spirit of grace. We do that looking unto Jesus, our, the author and the finisher of our faith. Because it may come to where you're afraid of what the world can do to you. Now, be bold. Be bold. Because even then, Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I pray the Lord richly bless you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this lesson tonight. Thank you for opening it up in our hearts. Father, thank you for saving. Thank you for forgiving of sins by your power. For we did not love you. You loved us first. And you gave your Son to die Father, it, we don't realize just how great a love that is until you opened our hearts to where we receive it. Father, how you change our lives. Father, we do pray that the frustration of this body that we have, Lord, you know our, our frail frame. You know that it is waxing old. It's, it's painful. 
There's disease. There's things that the sin has caused. Just the, the fact there's sin in the world. But Father, we know that our victory is in you. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Father, may you reassure us day by day where we can be a testimony to others, Father, of just the hope we have of Jesus Christ in us and how he died and how he was buried and raised again the third day. If we believe on him today and confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. Thank you, Father, for, your, for all that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, please. And